Hello and welcome. Okay. I can hear myself. Let's see if that works. Put back in here. My wife changed up her sitting position so she's a little further off my shoulder. I'll see what she says. A thumbs up. There you go. Okay, cool. We say we hop in here. So we got a flying singer. So I was on there a minute ago. Uh, and ASU Sun Devil uh, on the runway. Um, taken off for a, a sunset flight. If it gets a little too much in the eyes, we'll change that up. But uh, that's the tentative plan. We'll see. Give fractals a second here. I did post the flight plan and the uh, general time of day. It's about 5.50. Should be about 6 in the game. So that's about when I'll be taking off. Restarting. Okay. Sounds good. Well, we're going to take off uh, Flying Singer, but we'll uh, we'll see in just a minute here then. Um, let me post this up, actually, and give, and give Flying Singer a second to get that in place. So if you don't have the game you want to follow along, this is the easiest way to. So that'll give you the same sort of information that I get on the iPad here. Zoomed out a little bit so you can see we are in uh, Florida Keys. So this is kind of the, the general area. And then we'll have quite a bit of ocean between uh, Key West and then Dry Tortugas. So we'll have a little bit of a little bit of time in there. So all right, let's get our takeoff roll going here. This is a zippy little plane. It's got some fun uh, landing gear, but it's also uh, designed to be fast, so get ourselves across this ocean. All right, so uh, while everyone's getting settled, a little information about the stream. So each week we pick a new national park to explore together. This week we're exploring Dry Tortugas National Park. For those of you with a copy of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, uh, you can follow along and I've uploaded the flight plan. Oh, Fractor just posted it up right there. Thank you. Uh, you. There's also that other link if you want for uh, following along without the game. I've also researched the park in preparation and added any new information with sources to the National Park Wiki page. Why Wikipedia? So there's two main reasons. It's a it's a way to make it's a way to give uh, sorry it's a way to make sure the facts here are checked by others, and it's a way to give back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. So to that end, if you notice anything incorrect or that should be clarified, um, please help fix the Wikipedia pages. Uh, as the Wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. Also good to know, we'll vote near the end of the live stream on the next perk that we want to go to. So look for that in the chat and other conversations, uh, ideas. I know we have uh, uh, ASU Sun Devil is uh, doing VR today, so uh, we'll be curious how that goes. We'll give a, a debrief at the end. Um, but everyone else, feel free to throw questions, thoughts, ideas. Um, and I'll, I'll make sure I'm checking the chat as we go. All right, off our left wing here, this is Key West. You can see the, the highway that connects all the keys. Kind of do a little bit of a tour here. If you haven't been down, it's like a, a whole just row of islands back to back. A uh, little disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator today. So please don't try this in real life. Without further ado, I'm Jules Altus, and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Dry Tortugas National Park. Okay. Thank you for Actals post up that poll. Uh, the other one that I'll mention real quick before I forget, we uh, I uploaded the uh, videos to YouTube. So for past live streams, they only last on Twitch about 60 days. Um, and so some of the older ones are, are gone now. I did put them on a YouTube channel, so they're all available at that link that Fractals put up. I haven't yet made them public. I want to get the descriptions right. Um, right now, they're just like title plus video. Um, but if you are interested to see some of the older ones, there you go. Um, yeah, that's at least available for you if you'd like it. Uh, quick heads up, the music at the beginning was by Howard Harper Burns. So if you enjoyed that, is a good artist for that kind of music. Let me see. Makes sense. Makes me miss the Florida Keys. Yeah, Island Happen is so fun. So fractals, yeah, making makes me miss the Florida Keys too. Yeah, I've only been down there once and only a little ways. Um, but agreed, 
un unfortunately, I, I didn't try any seafood when I was there, which was a pretty big mistake. Um, but yeah, that's a good way to do it. All right, so straw poll results. People, we have one person who's been there in the last 10 years, uh, no one who has uh, been there a long time ago, and then not yet for three votes. So I'm in that not yet camp. I have not been to Dry Tortugas. Um, the person who was there 10 years ago, that's really cool. It's, it sounds like a both a very cool park, but also a very hard park to get to. But quite an, uh, an accomplishment to make it out that far. All right. Let me, you know what, I'm going to change my time of day just slightly because I want to be able to show what uh, Key West looks like. So I'm actually going to zip back in time just a ways. So flying over a, a relatively big airport here. You can see, so the setup, there you go. Hey there. So the setup here is um, kind of all these interconnected islands and there's a highway that runs down the whole length. So we'll fly right over Key West and then we'll make our way off to Dry Tortugas, which will be a lot of ocean. So, Dry Tortugas National Park is a national park in the United States, about 68 miles west of Key West in the Gulf of Mexico. The park preserves Fort Jefferson and the seven Dry Tortugas Islands, the westernmost and most isolated of the Florida Keys. The archipelago's coral reefs are the largest, uh, are, sorry, are the least disturbed of the Florida Keys reefs. So the least disturbed reefs, which is something they talk about a lot. Uh, it's a point of pride for the for Dry Tortugas. He has a great view of Key West. Uh, if I was going to go down there, I'd want to rent a plane. This is uh, this is definitely the way to see it. Actually, my first community flying event was in Microsoft Flight Simulator was to uh, Key West, and that was one of those moments where I went, "Oh, this is a this is a cool way." I kind of dipping around the the bridges and stuff because you can fly under these bridges. All right, I am excited to say that there is a friendly ranger, Chris. Uh, he'll talk to us a little bit about Jar Tortugas, and he has some good uh, footage of what the park looks like and a little bit of the snorkeling in the area. It's about like seven minutes long or so. So I'll pull that up real quick. Um, really good overview. Rent a boat instead. Fractals is saying to rent a boat instead. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be fun. Maybe you got to do two trips, you know. All right. Let me grab my headset open, make sure I get the start of this is right. Well, welcome to Dry Tortugas National Park. My name is Chris Ziegler. I'm the lead interpretive ranger and historian for the park. So Dry Tortugas National Park began its life in the National Park Service back in 1935 as Fort Jefferson National Monument. Uh, back then it was set aside to protect uh, the big fort here and, and the surrounding waters. However, in 1992 they elevated that status to National Park. And the main reason is, is this cluster of islands represents the end of the Florida reef system. That's approximately the third largest reef in the world. We became a National Park because we're not only the end of it, but that also makes us the most pristine because it's had the least amount of human activity out here. So we have some of the best coral you're going to find anywhere in the Florida Keys for snorkeling. It's very nice right here around the fort. But we also have a lot of cultural resources. We have this magnificent fort, the third largest seacoast fort the United States ever built. We also have numerous submerged cultural resources and terrestrial archeological resources. Centerpiece, of course, for most visitors will be Garden Key, where historic Fort Jefferson is located. The large 19th century fortification encompasses approximately 10 acres. It's where your trip will spend most of your day as you're here. This is where the ferry boats as well as seaplanes tie up. Now you're probably wondering, well, why the heck would they build a fort out here of this size? Out here in the middle of nowhere, if you will. Well, if you think about it, when we left Key West this morning, here's Key West, we got Cuba to the south of us, and the Dry Tortugas is to the west of us, 70 miles. These islands that we're on right now are smack dab in the middle of that trade route. The U.S. wanted to occupy these islands so that nobody else could, so that they could continue to try to protect the coastline. As far as snorkeling goes today, this is going to be your best bet over here off of South Beach. You can go to the right, follow that moat wall, you can go all the way around the back side of the wall here. The other thing that I really like to do is get in off South Beach and go to the left. And you see those pilings that are sticking out of the water over there? There's a set here and a set over here off North Beach. You can go in either one. Water's clear, it's beautiful. 
along the wall, there's a lot of soft corals and some hard coral heads um, out a little further, but we saw some purple fans and we saw a little green moray eel, a few fish, tons of different kinds of mollusks on the bottom. We saw a horse conch with a bright orange body and he was slowly moving his way across the bottom. Pretty neat critter. If you come out in the summertime, especially beginning in, let's say, May to June, that's when we have a great number of our sea turtles coming in. So on the ferry ride or seaplane ride out, you're likely to see numerous turtles in the water. For those coming in the spring and a few months, even in the fall, the migratory birds are really spectacular. So we have many species of warblers, occasionally even have the burrowing owl that frequents out here. We have, of course, the sooty terns and the brown noddies that inhabit the islands behind me in nest. The frigate birds are here year-round. In addition to that, we have a lot of other wildlife. Of course, the fish species here are just absolutely amazing. You'll see some of the best coral reef fishes anywhere, uh, that, just anywhere you're going to find snorkeling, from a beach especially. We have a great number of nurse sharks that inhabit the, the bay behind me. It's actually one of the premier areas for nurse shark research. So lots of different species of, of marine animals and pelagic birds that use the area. Quick pause, pause the uh, video and flip over so we can look at where we are. So if I turn around a little bit. So we're leaving Key West just over there. There's a number of other keys just off the end here. So this is the Mule Keys. Looks something like, actually the iPad is just as good as this, but I'll show you anyway. So it looks something like this. So we're flying over Archer Key right now. We'll pass over uh, to kind of the northern half of this. Right, hopefully that wasn't too much of an interruption. Since there's a lot of ocean, I figured we should look at the keys while we can. All right. Dry Tortugas is definitely a unique national park out of all of them that I've seen. Just being on this island setting and the vast majority of it being this giant fort. <laughs> The fort itself is actually a lot larger than what I was anticipating. The beaches are absolutely beautiful here. I would like to say to visitors that this is probably a pretty cool spot to camp overnight. Next time I come back here, I think I probably would plan a camping trip and stay overnight here. Well, we're here for the day. We're down from Montreal, Canada, and uh, just came in this morning and about to board the ferry and go back home soon. We took the tour of the fort this morning. We learned about the horrible life conditions they had up here for many years as it seems. It was probably a pitiful place to be back in time, but now it's become paradise, I think. Well, when you land, you get a tour for about 45 minutes, and then you get to walk around, do a little bit of what you liked, and have a bit of lunch on the boat. After that, we headed out to the beach, got our snorkeling gear on, and went off into the water. The diving is amazing, the day is amazing, the water is amazing. It's a hard place to miss if you can get to it. If you're a visitor wanting to come see dry tortugas, there's really three main ways you can get here. The most frequent way is our commercial ferry service that comes out. It's called the Yankee Freedom. You can purchase tickets and board that vessel at the historic bite in Key West, Florida. The other main option is the seaplane service that flies out daily from the Key West airport. It's a float plane. You take off on land at the airport and then you uh, get to land on the water here at the fort. It's really a unique experience, a lot different than most of your commercial aircraft you get to fly on. The normal seaplane tours, you're out here for about two hours. They offer a small guided tour, and once again, the day is kind of yours. You can explore the fort, or a lot of people like to snorkel and just take it easy. And of course, the third option is still uh, come out on your own private boat if you're brave enough and have a vessel. 70 miles out in open water, it does require a little bit of seamanship to get here, and of course, the right equipment. But for those that come out on their vessel, it's a rewarding experience and some of the most beautiful water you can actually come out and see in the United States. Camping is also provided. Campers that come out on the ferry are usually limited to three days due to the amount of gear that you can carry on the boat. However, the Park Service has a rule you can actually stay 14 days if you come out on something other than the ferry. Camping is very primitive, so you have to pack in your own water and everything like that as well as pack out all of your trash. This is my fourth day, it's three nights, four days, leaving today. Uh, it's the dry Tortugas, so you have to bring your own water with you. 
So you got to bring everything. So you got to bring all your food, you got to bring your, your snorkel stuff, your clothes, your tent, your sleeping bag, you know, any kind of stuff you need to eat with. Over the past four years, I've come here six times camping. I keep coming back because it's an amazing place. Amazing snorkeling with like tons of fish and really big fish. The fort is really neat just to wander around in. And then also when the boat isn't here, there's like nobody here and you have the whole place to yourself and it's just really neat. At night there's 18 gazillion stars. But other than that, you're like stranded on a tropical island. Making me nervous, fractals. Uh, hopefully, others could hear the the video. Okay, I got at least no blood. I said it's okay. Well, let me know, fractals. I can uh, I can give you the digest afterwards. Now I'm gonna take these off. Okay, so that's dry tortugas. Uh, the the seven minute version of it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the the other details. Fort Jefferson is fascinating as a fort. We don't have enough time today to get into it much, but I'll post a video into Discord afterwards that has a really good overview of why they thought of it as a strategic point, um, what it, how it fits into the other forts that we have along our coastal system, and that sort of thing. Uh, never mind my okay. So Fr Fractal's uh, audio glitched out on his computer. That's too bad. I heard it wonderfully. <laughs> Thanks, Mad Wisman girl. Um, okay, so that's that's Dry Tortugas. And we'll fly by the uh, the fort. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator actually has a really pretty good model of the fort, so it's pretty fun to see. And they have a working lighthouse in the game, which is kind of fun. So uh, a Flying Singer and uh, ASU Sun Devil, if you switch to a nighttime flight, the lighthouse actually rotates and lights up the fort, which is pretty fun. So uh, person of the week this week is the person who discovered Dry Tortugas. So the person who discovered Dry Tortugas is Juan Ponce de Leon, who you may have, uh, first of all, you may have heard his name pronounced differently. So I watched about probably 10 YouTube videos and each of them had a different pronunciation. So that was my best attempt at a Spanish name. Um, but Ponce de Leon uh, is also famous for uh, being the person who went, who named Florida and the person who was looking for the Fountain of Youth. Uh, one of those things is true. So he did name Florida. He did not uh he was not looking for the fountain of youth though that has been pretty well disproven uh, by historians but people still talk about it all the time so that's where you may have heard him that's what i remember him from in school so he was the first european to see dry tortugas in 1513 and he decided to name it tortugas which is spanish for turtles because he caught 160 sea turtles when he was there later on they they gave the the islands the the title dry and that was actually meant as a warning. And it was a warning that if you visited the islands, there was no fresh water for you. And so sailors had to bring their own water sources there. So dry tortugas, it's turtles from Ponce de Leon, and then uh, dry is kind of a, a warning. And we'll do a little pan around this. This is the uh, Marquesas Keys. That's what that looks like in real life. It's all, all dirty, although you can see the the kind of tidal veins through it. And that was also something you can see in the keys if you look at aerial photos. And actually, I have one of those real quick. It's so like this is key, the Key West where we came from. You can see the same sort of like tidal um, influence in there. All right. Did you get your audio working again, Fractals? Just like a quick restart or something. Uh, so what else? So Ponce de Leon, uh, he's a Spanish explorer. He was born in Valladolid, Spain in 1474. There's little known about his family, but he was noble birth and served in the Spanish military from a young age. He uh, led an expedition to Florida, which is what he named, and then uh, kind of charted a lot of the area around the uh, Florida Keys. Quick sidebar, he also has the greatest signature I've ever seen, so it's a little unrelated, but if you can sort of, like I can see sort of Leon maybe in here, um, but kind of a, an incredible signature. I'm just imagining some like grade school girl is like writing, you know, Mrs. Ponce de Leon and, and he like comes over and he's like, no, 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 you gotta draw more, more squiggly lines on it. Okay. Anyway, all right. So as we pass this last set of keys here, then it is about 
40 nautical miles to the next piece of land. So we got a lot of ocean flying going on here. What we're going to do is settle ourselves back in here. Flip over back to that sunset we were talking about. Because that is the way to fly across the ocean. Okay. So Ponce de Leon. This is a little bit about the park, a little bit about uh, uh, Ponce de Leon, who's affiliated with the park and named Dre Tortugas. First topic, okay, fractals, all good. Good, glad to hear it. So first topic for today, naturally, is sea turtles. So tortugas in the name. Uh, fractals, you want to post up that poll. And so uh, I was talking with my, my wife, and she had some really good feedback about the topics, which is to make it more clear what the connection to the park is, because sometimes I like to pick something that's a little tangential. I did that for our second topic a little bit today. Um, so, so I'll try and get in the habit of that better. But uh, today, it's more, more straightforward. So dry tortugas, the turtles. We're going to talk about sea turtles. Um, you know what these are, I'm sure. So quick to, to get the attribution, because um, it's important that we uh, give credit where credit's due. So this is from a, a Wikipedia file about turtles. And I'm going to actually see if this just plays. Yeah. So you know what they are. These are sea turtles, right? Um, probably seen them mostly a swimming kind of thing, although you sometimes see photos of them on the beach. So when it's a photo on the beach, that's always a female turtle. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. So sea turtles, sometimes called marine turtles, are reptiles. There are seven existing species of sea turtles. The green sea turtle, the loggerhead sea turtle, Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, olive Ridley sea turtle, oxbill sea turtle, flatback sea turtle, and the leatherback sea turtle. So the important takeaway there is there's only seven different kinds. Uh, has anyone, out of curiosity, has anyone ever gotten to uh, touch a sea turtle or like swim with a sea turtle or anything like that? Uh, I, I was on a scuba diving trip uh, 10 years ago. It feels like it was yesterday, but um, and we uh, almost swam into a sea turtle, which was pretty, pretty cool. All right. Uh, Fractals got the pole. Thank you very much, Fractals. All right. So the pole. How does a sea turtle keep its body at lower salt content than the ocean? Uh, does it literally cry at the, sleep, the salt away? Or its shell repels the salt? Or urination, right? And fractals, the poll results. We got an even split. Okay, so we have two votes for uh, crying it away, two votes for the shell repels, and two votes for urination. Uh, this one is a little a little trickier. So the we'll talk about it in a, in a minute, but the well, we'll, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Uh, Flying Singer swam with sea turtles on the Big Island of Hawaii. That would be fun. The sea turtles in the Big Island of Hawaii would be a cool place to see them. See that guy swam with them? Okay. Not allowed to touch them, but very close. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder if that's... It's probably for them more than for you, but... Um, apparently the sea turtles in Hawaii will come out and, like, sunbathe. So I don't know if you saw them... Uh, like, they'll come out of the water and just hang out. It's kind of nice up there. Uh, okay, so sea turtles. So what do they look like? Uh, there's seven different types of turtles. The male and the female turtles are the same size. Sea turtles have a body shape that tapers towards both ends, uh, which reduces volume and means that the, the sea turtles can't, unlike other turtles, retract their heads and their limbs into their shell. So their heads and their limbs are, are stuck out, which makes them faster, but also then means that they don't have that extra defense. The leatherback sea turtle is the largest sea turtle, and it's about nine, sorry, six to nine feet in length and three to five feet in width. It was a big turtle. It weighs up to 1,500 pounds. It does not have a hard shell, and it's unique for this. So the other turtles that you encounter have hard shells. A leatherback turtle is a soft shell. Other sea turtles are four to five feet in length, so still pretty big, and then proportionally narrower. The limbs on the sea turtle are originally evolved for locomotion, but they also now can be used for eating or foraging for food. I'll show a picture of that a little bit later. So there's a couple other adaptations that a sea turtle has. The one that we talked about in the poll is about how it maintains a internal environment that has less salt than the ocean. To do this, they have to get somehow get rid of the salt, right? So like other marine reptiles, sea turtles rely on a specialized gland to rid the body of excess salt because reptilian kidneys cannot produce urine with a higher ion concentration than seawater. So their kidneys can't produce 
higher concentration of salt than seawater, and so they can't use urination as a way to, to get that uh, balance. Instead, they have a specialized gland. A specialized gland is called a ly uh, lychromel. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, but the lychromel gland is actually the same gland that we have. It, it is about like right here in your eye, but it is also what provides the salty tears that you would have if, you, uh, if you're crying. So this sort of like the same, the same system is a similar kind of thing to what sea turtles have. And just like how your tears are salty, uh, sea turtles' tears are saltier than the ocean, and so they can get rid of that excess salt. So then you'd expect to see uh, some sort of picture online of a sea turtle uh, with a little bit of uh, salt excess getting getting washed away. So there you go. This is It looks a little sad, but it's really a, a natural thing for, for the sea turtle. That's just getting rid of salt. Uh, Fractal saying that thing was massive. Yeah, the leatherback turtle is huge, just enormous. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of people laying down in the tracks, and it's like a full person's width wide. Okay, so so that's how they get rid of that excess salt, is they, they can kind of cry it out, basically. Uh, they have a lot of other problems that they, they need to deal with. Um, with the salt, I won't I won't super go into it, but they um, one thing to consider is the leatherback turtles primarily eat jellyfish, and jellyfish are mostly made of salt water. So all of a sudden, they're not only ingesting extra salt, but they actually need to get rid of it. So the leatherback uh, turtle can can get rid of a lot more salt than an average turtle. As far as diving, so sea turtles are air breathing reptiles, and so they do have to regularly surface. They spend the majority of their time underwater, and they can hold their breath for long periods. So typically five to forty minutes. Um, they can remain underwater, though, for uh, four to seven hours if they want to. So this is a picture of it coming up for breath. Just got to breathe there like the rest of us. Below the, um, as far as navigation, so a sea turtle uh, moves all around the uh, ocean when it's traveling. And so I couldn't find a, a public domain or a Creative Commons picture, but the, the path that a turtle goes around is kind of like, all over the place, but it can be from Florida down to Cuba and around and then up and over through the Gulf and back to, to dry tortugas um, for nesting. So it, it, it has quite a bit of range that it travels. Um, but to do that, it needs a specialized kind of navigation system. Uh, for instance, when you're deep underwater, you have less light, and so you can't really navigate by like celestial cues or something. So instead, they have this uh, kind of two-part magnetic compassing system. So they have a bio-coordinate magnetic map, which essentially means that they can position, they know their position relative to some target goal in latitude and longitude. So they have an internal uh, magnetic map. They also have a magnetic compass, which they can use to determine which direction they need to keep heading. So kind of a north-south sort of, sort of setup for a compass. So that is how hatchlings are able to get back to the sea when they're first born. And I'll show an adorable photo of some hatchlings. So when they're first born, they're able to use that same uh, sense of, of direction to get themselves to the sea. And then adults, that's how they navigate back to where the nests are. All right, beautiful sunset over uh, Gulf of Mexico here. So we'll go back in time and tell you what, we'll go a little bit earlier in the day. It's a little less, uh, less exciting, but it's fine. Uh, so that's that's how they get around is they have this kind of magnetic compass uh, as far as eating they uh, a lot of them are uh, omnivorous throughout their entire life so they'll eat both plant and animal the green sea turtle changes diets over its life so juveniles are uh, omnivorous but the adults are uh, herbivorous so you'll see pictures of them trimming seagrass and algae and they're considered an important part of this because they're the animal that trims the grass so in my mind, it's like the goat you would see on top of a house, but it's the sea turtle eating the grass in the, in the seabed. Okay, I look. I keep looking to make sure I'm not going to accidentally fly into the ocean, which is <laughs> a potential problem when it's all blue everywhere. Okay, so, so that's kind of the, the life cycle. The first uh, three to five years of life, the... A uh, sea turtle spends most of their time just floating in the seaweed mats, like that picture I showed. Once they reach adulthood, then they come closer to shore and they spend most of their time there. Yeah, hey, ASU Sundell. See, uh, you probably can't see my screen, but I can see you just flying up above. Uh, I mentioned nesting. So this is one of the, the phenomena that a lot of people like to go and watch. So a 
mature nesting female hauls herself onto the beach, almost always at night, and finds suitable sand to create a nest. Using her hind flippers, she digs a circular hole 16 to 20 inches deep. And then in that hole, she'll leave somewhere between 50 and 350 eggs. So this is what, this is what that hole looks like, and then the eggs underneath. Not a great photo of the eggs, but they're, uh, you can kind of get a sense of the size. After she uh, lays the eggs, then she will re-sculpt and smooth the surface to camouflage it so that it's basically undetectable. So the sea turtle doing that. You can see she's kind of using her fins to just um, throw sand over and then uh, she'll move forward a little bit and keep doing that until it looks pretty well hidden. She'll also potentially dig decoy nets. And so she might have multiple net, uh, nests, excuse me, that she, she digs in a night just to, to kind of throw everyone off a little bit. Hey there. Uh, those eggs then incubate for about 50 to 60 days. One really interesting thing about uh, sea turtle eggs, which is a phenomena I didn't know was a possibility, but the uh, sea turtles have te uh, temperature-dependent sex determination, meaning that a developing baby sea turtle uh, will either be male or female depending on the temperature that the egg is exposed to. So warmer temperatures produce female hatchlings, while cooler temperatures produce male hatchlings. So I didn't realize that animals had the ability to... to uh, change the gender like that. Now, interesting, interesting uh, ability. All right, and of course the most important part of this is the adorableness of the sea turtles after they hatch, which is one of the things that people really like to go and watch. So if you haven't seen the, the sea turtle frenzy as they try to go to the beach, particular treat. I'll watch the first two seconds again. end of the day detox is like I'm gonna watch some sea turtles run to the sea all right so that's uh that's sea turtles in a nutshell the in a turtle shell uh some good news that is coming up more recently with turtles as a result of COVID-19 activity on beaches has basically stopped which is unfortunate if you live near a beach um, but it has resulted in an increased sea turtle nesting so in Thailand, the highest number of nests in the last 20 years have been found in 2020. And turtles are thriving across the United States as well, uh, with the lack of noise and pollution. So it's a, a rough year for us on the land, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a pretty good year for sea turtles, sounds like. All right, so in summary, sea turtles are one of seven species. The leatherback is unique in not having a hard shell, and they're all unique in very efficient limbs for both swimming and eating. Sea turtles are able to navigate the oceans with a sort of internal compass. Female turtles lay eggs on land, but male and, and male sea turtles never return to the land after they first enter the water. And the uh, eggs are then, the gender will be determined based on the temperature that they are exposed to. So I was, I was learning about sea turtles and this gland that essentially amounts to, to crying away the salt, I thought was a really really interesting adaptation as a, as a way to, to get that extra salt away. And, and so it occurred to me, um, you know how you might describe some people as salty, right? Which is like a, a term meaning irritated or angry, like a, a salty sailor or something like that you might hear. So I was thinking about this and maybe, maybe the issue all along is it's just been too long since they've had a good cry. You know, maybe that's all it is. Um, that's enough about sea turtles. Fractals, you want to post up uh, the next topic here as we make our way to East Key. <laughs> Thank you, Fractals. All right. <laughs> so our our next topic today, and I promise we'll talk about how it relates to the park. Maybe it may be straightforward, but uh, is walls in buildings as a sort of invention, really. And so. Uh, the poll on this one is, who's the biggest stud? Is it Jules? Is it Fractals? Who's over there for me? <laughs> or is it the corner stud of your house? Give everyone a second to vote on that one. So walls and buildings, why walls? Fort Jefferson is considered an excellent example 
of brick mason masonry, excuse me. And as we get close, you'll see this a little bit more too, but you can see the brickwork in here and the arches up above. And uh, there's a great video of, of some masons who are doing repairs recently and saying that they're learning techniques that they've never seen before just in repairing the building. That's how, that's how excellent an example it is. And so it kind of got me thinking about the... Well, I, oh, a quick other fact about it. So Fort Mason is the largest brick masonry structure in the Western Hemisphere, and it's composed of more than 16 million bricks. So it's a huge brick, brick uh, structure. And I was thinking about it, and there's a couple of, of thoughts that occurred to me, but one of them was, why bricks? And then the other one was, like, why did it last so long, right? Like, I, I as a structural design, I would have... I would have thought something, I don't know, I just I didn't expect it to have that kind of staying power for something so old, especially that it's exposed to so much weather and uh, literal hurricanes pass over it uh, from time to time. So this started me down a path of buildings in general and how we decide what the, the walls of a building are going to be made out of, which, of course, if you're like me, you've been trapped in uh, the same basic room for uh, a year now, and so... Uh, Maybe it's something to do with that too, but but I hadn't really thought about like what is what is the design that went into a fort like this? What is the design that went into the house that I, that I'm in now and that kind of thing? Uh, brick, <laughs> yeah, crazy Tycho brickwork. I sure hope it does. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's fair. There's a lot of buildings made of brick, so if that was a problem, uh, we probably would have found out a long time ago. But why does it work? Right, that's the question. All right, so so walls. The purpose of a wall is to support roofs, floors, or ceilings. It also encloses a space as part of the building envelope along with the roof to give the building form. It provides shelter and security in the building, and it can house various types of utilities like electrical wiring or plumbing. So that's the reasons that you, you would need a wall. If you're gonna build a wall, you have two basic options, it turns out. So you can either use a framed wall or a mass wall. And Fort Jefferson is a mass wall. We'll talk about that one second. Framed wall is probably what your house is, is using, depending on the style of, of house you're in. So framed wall most often has uh, three or more components to it. Uh, they're the structural elements. So think of like two by fours, studs in your house, uh, the insulation that goes into the wall, and then finishing elements like drywall or paneling, that kind of thing. So among those two, okay, I will... Let me look at the chat real quick, and then I'll pull back to that. Poll results. All right. Uh, fractals, I beat you on this one. All right, so who's the biggest stud? Jules with two votes, Fractals with one vote, and then the corner stud of your house with one vote. Um, knowing both both myself and Fractals pretty uh, pretty well, I would say that the corner stud of your house is the biggest stud, but, but I appreciate the vote of confidence. All right, so, so framing. So you basically have two options. You can do heavy framing or light framing. Heavy framing is when the vertical supports are few and heavy. So you might get something that looks like this. So it would be a heavy framing style. You also might get a building that looks kind of like this. So if you get like the like a, a structure of this kind. There's another style that's similar, which is called half timber. And so half timber is this style, which you may have seen if you've ever been to Germany or, or a place like that. Actually, out of curiosity, have people um, have people been to Germany before? Um, or anywhere that has a style of houses. Actually, we have some kind of near where we live. I think it's just someone liked building it that style. Um, but this particular kind of heavy framing approach, I thought was a really, it's a neat example of it, and it's a kind of an art choice, right? Put the framing on the outside. So that's what you get in Germany. Hey, uh, CPT void. Uh, okay, so that's what you get in Germany. Um, or that's what you get if for a heavy frame, at least as one style. The other way you could go is light framing, and this is more likely to be um, if you are like kind of a standard approach. It's the dominant structure and approach in North America and Australia. Uh, it's minimal structure, uh, larger area, easier to build, that kind of thing. It looks kind of like this. So if you've seen that in a, a half-built house, that's what that is. That's uh, light framing. And then if you look at a design on here, so if you haven't heard of a stud before, so the stud would be these long um, pieces of timber that go up and down like this. And then the corner stud that I made a reference to in that poll is the, in this diagram it's called a post. Um, I In my visual dictionary, it's called a corner stud. So I want a corner stud. 
Um, but it's this this end piece that supports a lot of the weight of the house. So this is what light Raymond looks like. Uh, and Rosno, Denmark has a lot of them. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. I would live in a house like that. I think it would be pretty fun, actually. Um, all right. Do a quick pan over to Dry Tortigas off our left. We'll get a much closer view of it in just a second. ASU Sun Devil dipping in and out. I don't think the doors are big enough to fly through ASU Sun Devil, but, I mean, you could try. It'd be kind of interesting. All right. And we're going to come up to Loggerhead Key. So a lot of these keys... Uh, we passed over a couple as we were flying in. They all look kind of similar. Uh, Loggerhead Key is actually the biggest one, but let me show you kind of what they look like in real life. So this is this is a picture of one of the keys in, in Dry Tortugas. I think this is the Bush Key. And then we're coming up on Loggerhead Key, which looks like this. This is the biggest island, biggest key in the area. And then there's a lighthouse on the key as well. So this is what people use for navigating. For those of you who were here for Acadia, you'll remember a lighthouse is pretty well. Uh, but this, they have this lighthouse, and there's another uh, decommissioned lighthouse in Fort Jefferson. Right. Okay, so so light framing. So we have you can either do framing walls, heavy and light, or your other option is a mass wall, and that's what we have in Fort Jefferson. So a mass wall is solid building material, uh, masonry, log building, hardwood construction, adobe. Uh, tin cans, ice, whatever, all those work. It looks a little bit like Fort Jefferson, um, and when it's being built up, it looks like this. If you ever seen people laying brick, that's what that's all about. Let me, I gotta do a quick turnaround here, so we'll pivot our wing around uh, Loggerhead Key. The lighthouse doesn't show up in the game, unfortunately, but it's right in the center of the island with those other buildings. We'll make our way back to Fort Jefferson. You can go uh, swimming off the beach here. I think it's on the it's on the west side of the island. There's like good swimming apparently. It sounds like the thing to do, by the way, is to bring your own boat out here if you can, because you get a lot more flexibility. Although I would go by seaplane, obviously. Okay. So and we're gonna come up on Fort Jefferson. Before we pass, let me show you a couple pictures from it. This is Fort Jefferson, the fort. That's what it looks like from the sky. This is a view of the entrance. You can see that brickwork in there again. That's what got me thinking about walls. And then the parade field is pretty famous. This is the center part of the of the fort, which you can't see very well from the game. And then the ferry. This is a view from the fort of the ferry, which doesn't show up in the game at all, but uh, just to give a sense of kind of the area. All right. Let me flip back here. We'll see if we can get flying in close here like uh, Flying Singer and um, ASU Sun Devil have been doing. It's like when I do the canyon runs, I'm always a little nervous, like, don't run into the fort. Okay, so you can see the moat all around. See some of these, uh, that brickwork that I mentioned. There's the lighthouse off on the top left. ASU Sun Devil, a fixture of Fort Jefferson. So we can get a little turnaround here. This is a pretty aggressive turn, but that's okay. There's that parade field in the center. And you can see they actually modeled the cannon, uh, cannon excuse me, along here so you can see some of those. Okay. Close that one up. Okay. So there you go. Hello, Fort Jefferson. All right, so Fort Jefferson is this mass wall structure style or, or wall wall design. So it's got the uh, bricks is what they use, but it could be anything like I mentioned, even ice it technically counts. Uh, let me look at the time real quick. So I'm going to do this. We passed by the keys that we were already at, and we won't be able to make it back there. So I'm actually going to fly out to the east key, and then I'm going to circle back to Loggerhead again, and then pass by Fort Jefferson probably right about the end. Uh, so ASU Sun Devil and Flying Singer, if you want to do the same, basically I'm heading uh, east and then I'm going to head west and then I'll head east again. It's a not very complicated uh, set of things. We'll see if we can see the east down. Uh, okay, so depending on your uh, solid material of choice, you have a different process, but with bricks, you have a, a pretty big advantage 
in a couple of places. One is they're non-combustible, so they aren't going to start on fire, which is a nice protection of the building. They're also more resistant to projectiles, such as, uh, well, cannons, but also debris from hurricanes and tornadoes. And so that would be a reason why the fort would particularly want something like that, or why it would be able to stand up against a hurricane if it passed through. Because that, that brickwork is something that gives it a lot of extra uh, structural strength. Couple of disadvantages though, so it can uh, degrade with a, a freeze thaw cycle. So if it's constantly ice getting in there and breaking them apart, it's also very heavy, so it can start to settle and crack. This is something that happened at Fort Jefferson. Actually, it's kind of settling into the ground. It's a problem we got to deal with. Uh, also, it can't do oscillation very well. So uh, materials like concrete or wood or metals are better for like an earthquake, for instance. And Fort Mason wouldn't do so well with that. Or Fort Jefferson, excuse me. An interesting piece about masonry, though, is that it, the material, especially uh, bricks like this, have a very particular property about them. And this is the way that they um, distribute compression across the, the surface. So if you push on the top of a piece of, like, let's say, uh, a metal wall, you'd get uh, pressure uh, rings that look like this. Right? But if you push on top of brick, it actually kind of spreads it all the way through and actually sends it all the way to the ground. So the difference of how it distributes that sort of pressure is part of the reason that it, it holds up uh, differently. It, it holds up to different types of, of um, issues that you'd encounter. Okay, so we have frame walls, framing walls, we have mass walls. Another problem you're going to have, no matter what wall you're building, is what you're going to do about moisture. And especially if you're in the middle of the ocean, like we are in Dry Tortugas, uh, you're going to need something that protects the wall from getting flooded or, or uh, rotting over time if it's wet or something like that. So you have kind of three choices. You can use a moisture, moisture storage solution. So this would be typically with a mass wall like Fort Jefferson. It basically means that the wall itself absorbs the moisture and then sort of releases it on its own, which is a pretty handy design, uh, all told. You can have drain cladding. So this basically acknowledges that moisture is going to penetrate, and so uh, you need some sort of moisture barrier to keep that moisture away. And this is, if you ever see a building with this sort of wrapping around it, that's what that's doing. So this is part of a wall, but it's also it's just about protecting that uh, from moisture. And the other option you have is, is uh, face-sealed cladding. And this is basically saying, I'm going to make my wall leak-proof, and nothing's going to get in, and so moisture's not a problem. That's a, a little bit harder to pull off, but uh, it's another option you could do. All right, so if you're a fort, you probably want a way to protect your wall. You could, uh, If you're using cannons, like we are in Fort Jefferson, then a bastion is a good way to do it. And the reason for that, this is like the kind of star-shaped forts you'll see often. So I'll pull up that picture of Fort Jefferson again. You see the bastions sticking out here. Because they stick out, they can actually aim a cannon down the wall and protect the length of the wall in a way where if it was just a flat wall, you couldn't do that. So I haven't yet added bastions to our house, but knowing the practicality of it, I feel like I probably should. Just so much simpler, right? Uh, okay, so Fort Jefferson, Fort Jefferson and walls. In summary, walls can either be framed wall or mass wall. A framed wall is most common now and is composed of structural elements, insulation, and surface finishing elements. A mass wall is solid materials like brick or packed earth. Uh, that would be the kind of brick like we get in Fort Mason, just out our left window. One of the things that really struck me, though, about walls as I was researching it is all of the designs for walls are about getting the maximum height, right? Like, it's it's all about how can we can we have a stud that goes up two floors, and that's a common thing they'll do, uh, or can we stack them and kind of build each layer one at a time, stack the bricks higher in rows, that sort of thing. And I was thinking about that, and, and stacking up is cool, but you know what's also cool? is stacking in, right? Like, why doesn't anyone talk about that? And I was thinking about this, and you, you end up with not only twice the support, right? You got a second wall, but you have twice the insulation as well. And you know me, I love a good warm room. Uh, so this is right up my alley, right? So it got me thinking, could I build my own frame walls inside of the room that I'm in now? Right? So it's another layer of insulation, and our apartment's kind of old and a little drafty, so that's a plus. And... It's a great place to store old clothes so they aren't on the floor anymore, right? So instead of this pile just laying on the ground, I've got a strategic wall insulation uh, set up. It's genius. I know. 
All right. Uh, Fractals, you want to post up the poll for next trip? Um, and our options for uh, next next national park, wherever we want to explore, is Olympic National Park. Oops, I got a typo in there, fractals. Oh, that's right. An Olympic National Park, uh, Mount Rainier National Park, or North Cascades National Park. So these are all different uh, national parks in Washington State. There's was actually a request from my brother. He was, he's very excited to, to learn more about Washington. So uh, you're welcome, brother. I don't know if you're watching or not, but... Uh, yeah. Okay. I give people. I can't, I can't believe that joke. <laughs> Fractals. I can't believe that joke. Shaking my head. Yeah. 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 It it was pretty funny in my head. If it's in a constellation, um, it was also written when I was very chilly this morning, and I think that explains a lot. All right, I'll give folks a second just to vote on that one. While we're uh, while we're doing that, the other piece of it that's kind of kind of interesting, and we have a couple of extra minutes here. The, the word key, as in like the Florida Keys, comes from the Spanish word keo, and it means small island. So Florida Keys is Florida small islands, sort of self-explanatory name, but key sounds cooler, I suppose. Uh, okay, let's see. We got park results here. Olympic, uh, Olympic National Park for one vote, Mount Rainier with four votes, and then Northern Cascades for one vote. All right, Mount Rainier National Park it is. That'll be fun. Um, I think, yep, Mount Rainier, here we come, that's right. All right, we'll do one more flyby past Fort Jefferson, nicely modeled little thing, and I will do a little sign-off here. Uh, so today we talked about dry tortugas in Fort Jefferson, talked about sea turtles, and then we talked about walls and buildings, um, which relates to Fort Jefferson because Fort Jefferson is a master example of brick masonry. Uh, we talked a little bit about Ponce de Leon as well, who was not searching for the Fountain of Youth, although that is often what uh, people remember about him. He did name Florida, though, so parts of it are right. Fractals will post up a survey if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, Ma uh, Mad Wiss, uh, Min Girl, it was a great park. Um, one thing that was not captured is, I think, super well in that video is the reports of visitors to the park is that it is one of the coolest parks they ever visit. So it's like resounding, you have to go see it, and resounding, stay overnight if you can camp. So if you're okay with camping there, then uh, that's apparently the way to do it. So a uh, little tip for you. I try not to do too much just travel advice, but um, but it's kind of a cool thing to see. All right, we'll flip tonight and do a little... Oh, that's going to turn out. Probably not very well. I'm trying to show the lighthouse in the background here. Um, so fractals will post the... Uh, Tell your brother, uh, M. Rosno says, tell your brother that all three parks are super fun and you should visit all of them. I will do that. Yep. I'll send him all the videos after we go visit them too. Okay, so I'm excited to explore uh, Mount Rainier National Park with you next week. That'll be a blast. And with that, thank you for being my co-pilot today. Until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. See y'all next week.